give out. Um, our jurisdiction, or my jurisdiction, I'm part of District 25, which it covers the state of Arizona and Nevada, two states. We have four offices. In Arizona, we have Tucson, Phoenix. Anything south of Casa Grande belongs to Tucson. Anything north of Casa Grande belongs to Phoenix, all the way to the top. We have Reno, and we have Vegas. That's Vegas. That's our jurisdiction. So four offices for two states. And I traveled to both of them, many of them to give classes like we're doing today to volunteers, which it's very appreciative, not only in the community, but also for our agency, because we don't have the numbers to really be able to go to rural areas or be in everywhere at once. We do work with all the agencies, regardless of the government, faith-based, um, universities, international, their international department, um, mayors, city hall. We deal with almost everybody about immigration, educating them, or explaining what we do. <coughs> Let's see what else I'm gonna say before we go. Um, before I start, a little background on myself. I work for USCIS, been here five years, going on six, originally from San Diego, San Cedro, actually, so south city of the border. I started my career in 91, working the border as Legacy Customs, working narcotics, uh, import, export of merchandise, and then I went to the gang and intel. After that, I went to detention facilities where I interviewed detainees and housed them according to their crimes, uh, gang affiliation, religious groups, or anything, informants or whatever it might be, we housed them, that was my job, and deal with the consulates. That's what I still do now, but in a different level. Went to Iraq, they offered me to come back. They offered me a promotion as a military. Once I got back, you come to Phoenix, I said, well, one sandbox, another sandbox. <laughs> Not bad. So that's why I'm here, and I said I was gonna be here for one year. I went on six. So, thank you. We'll start with the application. Does everybody, yes, ma'am. Would you please tell me what you see USCIS stands for? United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. And we have offices almost every consulate, a U.S. consulate or embassy in the United States, around the world. Uh, we have approximately 36 offices nationwide. Um, and everything with the benefits of immigration to being legal in the United States, that's what we deal with. We do not arrest, like I mentioned, so on in our interviews, when people come in, we need to know the truth. Did they come legally and they overstay? Did they come through a mountain? Did they come, you know, with a fake documentation? Why? Because everything makes a difference for them to qualify. What I mean, if you learn anything in this, in today, this is what I would like you to at least memorize. That the immigration law is an indi individual law. What's good for one is not good for the other. What's good for your kid might not be good for the other kid. It depends on the law that was put in give you an example, right now we have the DACA, the Children's Act. There's many brothers and sisters that don't qualify for that. The laws are very strict at this age, at this time, you know, and the same thing, when Ronald Reagan did the last uh, immigration reform, there are laws that were placed, but in place by Congress, and the old laws, and they don't match. They don't talk to each other. So there's a group of people who are in limbo, literally who do not qualify for either of them. And to a certain degree, that's the cycle we have right now. Those who did not qualify, many of them, either because they were deported or didn't qualify for it. A lot of people come and just rush last minute. <clears throat> they might not be have been in the United States long enough when the law was placed, and now they're here, and they don't qualify for a benefit. And then they marry, have kids, but they still don't mind qualifying to them, whether into their kids, the United States are 21. In order for a kid to petition a parent, must be 21 years of age. You know how old you, how old you have to be to, to apply for citizenship? 18. There you go, 18. Um, you know how long you have to be in, a, in the district where you're applying? Three years. Three, Three months. Oh. Me. 
you're a resident, but you came from California or Utah or Colorado, and you just moved to Prescott, you must be in Prescott at least nine, three months, 90 days before the Phoenix office allows you to even continue the process. How long do you have to be a resident? Three years. Five. Or five. Mm -hmm. Or one year. <laughs> five years. If, you're, if you were benefited from either for employment, a sibling like a brother or sister, or um, you self-petition yourself. <coughs> self-petition yourself um, will be like a UT VAWA case. They self-petition themselves. They get approved. Um, they, they do five years. If you're married to an American citizen, three years. If you're a military member, one year. So you must be active military. Many people right now, especially California, Carolina, Fort Bragg, when they come out of their boot camp training, they're coming out with their, you know, their basic training graduation and also citizenship. Man, residents. And it's been for years. Many people who've been in Vietnam, Korea, they've been residents during World War II. But um, with the legal resident, you cannot be in the military. Nowadays, you can be in the military, but you won't get deployed. You can't leave the country if you're a resident. Because you, you need a, a security clearance. And only United citizens can get a security clearance. That's the whole purpose of one year trying to do it when they finish boot camp. They leave their boot camp and they go through the process meanwhile and they'll get a double. So they can then get deployed, get transferred to a unit they want or they qualify, intelligence, whatever it might be, and then they can move out. <coughs> Does everybody know what's an A number? A what number? A number. A numbers? Yes. The number of the controls on the green card? Correct. Every person that comes into a country legally or illegally and they get caught or gone through the process will have an A number similar to your social security. And that's the first thing you'll see in your application, A number. They go from, depends when they were here, they go from six to nine digits. A number is their identification in their application. Any time from the moment they get it <laughs> until they become a citizen, even then, they'll always have that same number. Nobody, there's no duplicate. You will never get two. A number. And that you'll get in the resident card. Almost everybody who has a resident card, you tell them what's your A number, they'll show you where it is. Because in order to you know the process, that's the first thing they ask you. They don't even ask your name. They ask, what's your A number? <clears throat> and that's what it is. Do you, everybody know what the A number means? What it stands for? Human beings. <laughs> That's what we emphasize in our office. Okay. It's not a file. It's not a tool. For other people, it might look like for us, it's a human being. Somebody applying for a benefit. You treat them with respect. You treat them with kindness, dignity. Even if they don't qualify. Even if you know they're lying. Even if they know they're false information. Do you follow the law? Do you deny the paperwork or the application? And you move on. But that's one of the things we push and we ask you that when you're doing this, treat them with kindness, respect. They might, you might not agree with their lifestyle, their religion, their faith, whatever it might be, but they still we still look at them as human beings and we push that as much as possible. There's a bad apples everywhere, but overall, my colleagues are pretty good at that. <coughs> See what else? Biggest mistakes? People use different colors for the application. Make sure you use a black ink color. Make sure at the end we'll go through it. Make sure you sign. Make sure they sign the application before they walk out of that office or that appointment. Do not argue with them. Do not get in discussions. Do not get very personal if they don't want to answer the question. Move on. We appreciate your time. Um, we appreciate what you're doing for them. Some people might not see it that way. But just remember, if they don't answer, they might be embarrassed. They might be 
hiding something, it's not your job to interrogate, question them. Just say, do you know this? Do you know the question? Yes, no, move on. Some people who live around your county, communities, might go to church with you guys. They'll be embarrassed to say, yeah, I got arrested for picking up a prostitution. Yeah, for drugs. Um, we've seen it all. Chase, uh, sex changes. Their spouse doesn't even know they have a chase, uh, sex change, or they've been married before, or they got HIV, or they're gay. They won't say that. So we don't ask you guys to, if they don't say it, if they don't want to talk about it, move on. When they come to us, we'll deal with it. If they lie, we'll deal with it. You're there to assist, help them, we appreciate it, but do not take it too personal. If they don't, if you feel gut feeling, because we all have that, it's like, man, this guy is, or this gal is just not there. Just move on, and don't take it personally. Just keep going through the application, and wish him luck. And we'll take care of the rest. We get a lot of information in our file. Um, the first process, once they submit the application, approximately 30 to 45 days, they'll get a notice to go to our office and do their fingerprints, biometric picture fingerprints. That goes with, uh, straight to FBI, they're digital, they go to FBI in West, West Virginia, they'll process them, they'll come back either with a hit, meaning they've been arrested before, or they have a warrant, or they're wanted, or no hit. Amazing. No hit means they have no criminal record, they've never been fingerprinted. There's many people that come into the country illegally, many times, especially the border towns, uh, for many years. They've been caught so many times with different names, but their fingerprints will never change. That's why we don't focus too much on the name, we focus more on the fingerprints for the criminal part. Because everywhere they go, they'll, they'll get fingerprints for whatever reason they got detained they're in the process of incarcerated. Uh, you all have an application, feel free to sign on them, write them, they're yours, they're your cheat sheet. Um, there's new ones for the applicant, so those you have, those are yours. You can write whatever you need. From the moment they get the notice to come for bio, from that time it's thir another 35, 45 days before they get a notice to come to our office and have an interview. What do you mean by bio? Biometrics. Oh, I'm sorry, file. It just had it short. Biometric fingerprints. Oh. Yeah. Acronyms. You know, the government, they say the more acronyms you come up with, the more you get paid. Oh, yeah. We right. got so many. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think right now I'm, I got 46 pages of just acronyms that the federal government uses. And that's just way too many. So once they get their notice to, for an interview, that's when we go through the application. That notice is only for that application. So they might have other applications pending. Um, they petition somebody else. That application, that notice is for that application only. They will go through a basic interview, every question. Um, if there's something in their file that has a red flag, we'll go through those. Been arrested or there's or their probation or anything. We'll go through every question concerns or issues that we might have. <clears throat> they get two opportunities to pass their test with one application. Meaning their test is, they study 100 questions. On the day of the interview, the computer will spit one of the tests. There's 10 questions each test. They must get six right on that day. And we go from top to bottom. Before we were able to skip, now we go from top to bottom. So after they pass their six, you stop there. Do you give them some kind of uh, information as to what the questions are going to be about? Or no? On the day of their biometrics appointment, when they finish their biometric the picture, they'll give them a red book that has all the questions and also a CD where they can listen in their CD. It's a CD they can listen in the car or whatever. So they will get one in our office. We have moved two years ago all the four offices are now in one building. So just, you'll have my car before we leave. That address is where we do everything regarding benefits of immigration, where they do their fingerprints, where they have their interviews for employment, for residency, for citizenship, for special cases, all in one roof. 
So it's very easy now to tell people, this is the address, go there and they'll take care of it. If they do an info pass appointment, which I think I gave you one, um, how to do an info pass, it has the website where to get forms, it's all there. Just be advised that if you go to Google or Yahoo and you look for USCIS, the first two or three websites that are there, they're not ours. They're privately. They'll have everything the same except at the end it says O-R-G, C-O-N, or N-E-T. And then you see G-O-V at the bottom. They charge for forms, we don't. Our agency, all the forms, you can download all the forms free. You can make a point to see us free. <coughs> so if you tell people, make sure if you're going to send them to the website, make sure they see that GOV at the end. Otherwise, they go and they look very similar to our, our website, and they'll charge it for every application. What else do we have before we go on? Two tries to pass your test. Is the history part, which is the 100 questions, the writing and the reading. The writing and reading will come out of the questions. So I might say, um, read this number three. And I'll say, the flag is red, white, and blue, which is the answer for one of the questions. And usually they use the answers of one of the questions as you're reading and writing. I might say something like, um, Statue of Liberty is in New York Harbor, which is the answer to one of the questions. So everything they're going to read and write will come from the 100 questions they study. There's waivers, and we'll go through it right now, on who can skip the reading and writing and do everything on their own native language. And we'll go through those right now. I'm trying to give you a little insight besides going through the application. So the 10 questions where you have to get six correct, which, what category does that fall under? What kind of questions? That's the one that I said you'll get a uh, 100 questions bio, uh, when you do your biometrics. You get a book with 100 questions. And you'll study those. And then it's divided into 10, ten, ten questions, 10 tests, 10 questions each. <coughs> Yeah. No, no, there's 10 tests right. with 10 questions. Right. You must get six when you get one of those tests in your, okay. in your interview. But not six out of 100. Yes, ma'am. If you oh. think about it, you're getting six because you're getting 10 in one test out of the 100, and then you have to get six out of those 10. But it's just at one yeah. time 10 questions. Yes. Period. No more. No more. Oh, okay. You fail, if, if, you, if you don't pass, you don't get six, you fail automatically get 30 days to come back. Well, they'll give you an appointment right there. The test you get the second time will be different than the first one. You won't get the <laughs> same test. So, and obviously those questions are gonna be different because you already used 10 of them. So you got 90 to go. Number one, as you can see, been a you must be a permanent resident, five or three years. One, you're rarely going to see the one we do in separate military. They go to different groups, and then those are special for five, three years. So that's your first part. Obviously, if they're doing it three years, instead of five, just think you're going to do a three-year. So these would be the only people that could qualify then Correct. for the application? Those would, yes. Resident of five to three years, okay. Three to five. <laughs> now what if they don't have an A number? They all have an A number if they're here legally. Oh no, but say they're not legal. They won't be going to the U.S. citizen process. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the moment they apply the first application, which is the I-130, 
with the 45, they'll get a name number assigned to them. So when they get their application or uh, letter back, when they do an I-130, which have, that letter actually will go to the petitioner. It says, yes, Juan Moran is recognized and approved your I-130, and they'll have an A number with that person. So they'll, obviously by the time they come to this level, they all know what's an A number, and they'll probably tell you, this is my A number. Number one on section two, current legal name. That is, yes ma'am. The I-130, the I is that, what is that? I mean, how, who, who, would be, who would be eligible for that? I-130 is your first step in the immigration process. Um, like I told the group before, um, it's the only application a federal judge cannot grant. That is, only an immigration officer can grant that. Which means, anybody that petitions anybody either a family member, mostly it's all family, you need a 9130 first to prove the relationship. If a business sponsors you, you they'll send an I-140. There's a business and an employee, future employee, there's a connection, that's what it is. It just shows the connection. So if you petition as a US citizen or a resident, your brother, your sister, you first have to apply for I-130. If you apply for your spouse, you must apply for I-130. If you apply for your brother, I mean your, your son, daughter, or parent, you must apply for I-130. So it's the first application in the immigration process. Only family, not close friend, not only. There's only the only people you can petition, siblings, spouse, children, and parents, and at different stage. You know, as citizen, you can do almost all four of them as residents, parents, and children, and spouse. No brothers. Okay. I'll take you uh, right now, for example, Mexico, Philippines, India, Afghanistan. And I haven't been since yesterday. I couldn't remember the fifth country. The waiting time for siblings is around 15 years. 15 years. For a resident, as a resident, to petition your son or, or spouse, it's approximately a year and a half to two years. As a U.S. citizen, it's approximately two months, three months. So there's a lot of benefits, but at the same time, for those that don't speak English, they like to wait for the waiver, which we'll go cover. But meanwhile, they could have done it as a resident as well. And if their children is over 18, they don't qualify anymore. They're adults. Yes. How do you do your own? You don't. You don't qualify. <laughs> that's the biggest problem. One of the problems we have in our system. So that's, that's why you have a separation of, you know. So you don't qualify once you're 18? No, you have nobody to petition for you. Oh. You're, you're an adult already. So what about, you know, these people that take home dreamers? Uh-huh. That's a separate program. Kids. Uh, separate program. They came as kids with undocumented parents. They were raised here. There's, no, there's nothing for them either. There's a governor, the president put a memo that they may not be deported for two years if they qualify for the DACA program. But it doesn't mean they're getting a status. They, they cannot get, um, they cannot be put in proceedings, meaning see a judge, deported, but they don't qualify for any other benefit either. Right now, if you qualify, for DACA, it's only for employment. That you can work, you can go to Social Security and get a Social Security number for work purpose only, and you can be here. Obviously, state law says you can't get a driver license. So they're still not here in the full term of legally. They're just not being processed to, as deportation. So yes. after two years, they have to renew? Renew, and I just came out End of this month, or end of March, the first group is going to be already expiring their two years. So they just extended it for two more years. Yeah, so DACA is totally separate. What does that stand for? Yeah. Uh, defer Action Children's. Defer.
D-O-C-A? D-A-C-A. D-A-C-A. But there's no, they don't have any numbers, and there's no way they'll be here for us, right? They have a nine number because they apply for that temporary program. So they did make a, once they submit it, they made an A number for them. But they, they can't apply for this, obviously. No, no, they, because they're not even legal residents yet. Remember, to be a citizen, you must be a legal resident for five years or three years, depending on how you came how in. How many times they are allowed to renew the card? Which card? The, the permit. The permit the as for DOC, for Dreamers? Yes, how many right now is the second not? time they can do it. Second so it, it is, this is the second time. It's a presidential memorandum, and he just approved for two more years. So we don't know after two more years what would happen. You know, it's going to be a presidential year. We don't know if the next president is going to keep it or cancel it. So we don't know. We just have to go with what we have right now. Or we'll pass immigration reform by then. <laughs> we don't know. There's so many talks. What we do in our agency is what's in the law right now. Our guess is just as good as yours because we're not involved really. Well, we have to stay neutral regardless for reasons of, you know, politics. <coughs> Number one, current legal name. What you're going to put there is their name at that time of applying. <coughs> Meaning many people are divorced, many people are widowed or married. That's what you're going to put. What is your legal name right now? <laughs> number one. Number two, you're going to get the resident card and see what it says in that resident card. <coughs> you will put what the resident card says. Well, even if they have another name and the resident card says something else, they can do that. Well, yeah, we're going to verify all that oh. because they might have been single or, or married and then they're now single or divorced or married and they've changed names. So that's what we're looking at. Right now, you know. So, so just to clarify, so when they get their residence card, um, they can't change that name until they, so, so they have changed their name with the state of Arizona, but not with immigration. Correct. Okay. Anyway, they want, once they do it legally, they have to submit a whole application again to change that name and get a new card with their name. So they just wait till they're applying for citizenship and do it again? That, most likely or when their car expires to renew it again. The most I had is somebody with a resident car 52 years. Oh, I was gonna say how long do they last 52 years? No, no, they last 10 years. You, oh. But you are you can be a resident for the rest of your life. You don't have to become a US citizen. Right. But you just so you, have to renew it. You just have, every 10 years, you have to renew your resident car. <coughs> 10 years? Yes, ma'am, 10 years. Uh, other names you use? Since birth, you know, and why we say that is because you get people with a Vietnamese name, and then they come here and resident, they want to have a their American name, but they still keep. So that's why we have another section. Uh, I, I don't. Do you mind if I ask questions? No, no, no. Please feel free. This is for you, not for me. So uh, I just was thinking about it, something else. Someone might ask uh, if they apply for this. Uh, the U.S. government doesn't make them relinquish their citizenship. Their other citizenship, does it? Can they keep their old citizenship uh, as far as the U.S. government is concerned? No. They will relinquish. Now, wait a minute. Even as a resident? No, no. no. He's asking oh. once you apply and you become, I'm assuming his, his question is once you apply and you went through the process and you become a citizen. Okay. You will. You do an oath and you relinquish everything. The United States does not recognize a dual citizenship. Your country of birth might. But the United States won't. So they can, if they keep it, it's it's not. Uh, it's not recognized by the United States. Okay. And the staff where I give, if you work in your country, in the government, military, and the consulate knows or we know, you automatically voluntarily uh, deny your citizenship. We'll deny it. In the government of your own country. Of no. Country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we'll deny you your citizen. Why? Because you automatically. First, you sign that documentation saying you will give all that right away. Your loyalty will be to one country only. So if you go to your home country and you work or you serve in the military, then you're on that. Government, mostly it's government and uh, military. 
Second thing, if you travel to another country with your your other passport of your country, and something happens, when you call the U.S. consulate because you need assistance medically or whatever, and they check how you came into the country, not as an American, but as another country, they say you automatically just revoked it yourself, if they want to push it that way. They say, you're no longer a U.S. citizen because you came as Canadian, Indian, uh, Mexican, you call your consulate. So it's not prosecuted, or, uh, but, but, but they may cause complications. Well, complication as much as counseling you, you're a citizen. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty complicated. Yeah, it is. Especially if you have everything in the United States. Then you have to go to court, fight it through the consulates, embassies, and you, when you're in another country, those consulates and embassies are very hectic. They take a while. So now you have to go through courts and proceedings and then get approval from a judge saying, no, I didn't know. One of the things I tell people, ignorance just like anything else in traffic or when you get your driver license, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. So, you know, I didn't know it's not gonna work. Especially when you got through this process and they tell you, you must read English, you must understand English, you must write English. So when you have all those lined up, there's no excuse to say, well, I didn't know, I didn't. Because it's in that question, when you do your oath, you'll repeat it. And that's why you repeat it in front of people, and in front of a judge, that you're willing to give up that citizenship. And it's, I think it's in the last page, the oath you'll read in, it's pretty detailed of what they're giving up. So it's already on your oath. By the time you sign it, gone through the process, and done your swearing, there's not too much you can say that I did not know or did not understand. Yes? Juan, excuse me, how about the people who have the double citizenship, like in Mexico and here? That's what he was just asking. We don't recognize dual citizenship. Your country of birth does. We don't, and you just have to be careful what you use. Because it can, your U.S. citizen can be revoked. Not by us, but by you doing your actions. So the United States does not, does not recognize dual citizenship. Name change, part two, uh, section four, five, six. Um, I'll say if they want to change their name. At the time of their citizenship application, they have uh, an opportunity to change their names. And those applications or that process of oath will go through the courts. If you're changing your name, we'll submit the documents to the courts. They will decide if they grant you that name change. And you'll do the oath in front of a judge. With the new name? Yes. You'll have two documentations <laughs> on the day of your interview when you want to do a name change. They both go to the court. Prior to your interview, the judge, if it's granted, they'll stamp it, sign it by the judge. The court keeps one, and they'll return one on the day of your oath, right behind your birth certificate, uh, your citizenship certificate. We do not keep one. So when you talk to people and say, we want to change your name, I say, that's fine. When you get it, don't lose it, because if you lose it, that's it. you have to go to the court, and good luck. Yes? I have a note here that all green card holders have a social security number, is that true? That's correct. Yeah, all green cards must, I don't, they, don't, they don't have to get it, but they will because why? Even if they don't work, their spouse probably does and they wanna do it on the taxes. So a lot of it is tax purposes. And obviously if they're working, they need a social security. So they all have one. And if they had a PIN number before and they go to social, they'll probably change it from the PIN to the social. Name change, when well, we went through that one. 11, uh, 10, 11, when you get somebody, what we need to know on number 10, if they have any, do they need assistance from us? Why we need to know, because if we need translators, we need to hire those for the day of their interview for the day of the ceremony. 
if they're in a wheelchair, we need to have make sure that have, we have the space for the wheelchair, you know. We need to accommodate it. That's the whole purpose of that. Not only on their interview, but also on their, sit, on their oath. 11. By the time they take the oath, however, they should know enough English to understand. Many, yes. But they're, we're going to go right, right on number 12. There's waivers. If you've been 55 years of age with 20 years of residency, you get to skip the writing and reading, but you have to do the civics part in your own native language. Same thing with number B, 20, 55 with 15 years of residency. You get to skip the reading and writing, and you can do the test in your native. C, 65 and 20 is the only different one. If you're 65 and 20, you qualify for that, you get to study 25 questions. And actually, they're the easiest ones, yes. Uh, 25 questions, and you'll get 10. You have to get six right. Uh, 648, you'll see in between 11 and 12. 648 is another way to waive everything, actually. And that's a medical form. And it's only done by doctors. And that one right there is more for people who have brain damage, brain issues. Uh, Alzheimer's and uh, had a concussions or incidents. That's what we're talking. People apply for that that have diabetic or have high blood pressure because they can't remember or, or retain information. That's not good for that. Your arthritis and all that stuff is not good. A 648 does not qualify you for a waiver. It's really more of neurological yeah, problems. Not. That's what it is. And it has to go through doctors. So if somebody says, well, I can't remember, you know, why not question and say, go through the application, you still have to have an application and say, well, download a 640 and go see your doctor. And it's pretty self-exploring. The doctors, when they see it, it's very precise. They know what they, how many tests, how many times have you seen that person, what type of test, what made you think that they are Alzheimer's, and they go through a rigorous, what type, there's certain tests they must make and process, and a lot of people don't understand that, even for Alzheimer's, there's a process of like 35, 45 days before they can finally say, yeah, you got Alzheimer's because of the type of test and results they go through. So a lot of people say, oh yeah, I saw the doctor. First time, and he says, I have Alzheimer's. Well, what type of test? And we'll send it back and we'll say, no, this doctor, and we'll question the doctor. I said, doctor, you said this, but this test test takes three visits for you to figure out the procedure. I said, why are you answering him on the first visit that he has, he or she has Alzheimer's. You know, so we all ask questions like that, especially if they, if they seen another doctor and then they went to another doctor, that's different. Then we'll get documentation from other doctors. And, and, and there's a section where the doctor will say, no, per the notes of doctor such and such, that's what I base my information. So a lot of the, the waivers for um, civic, for reading and writing, information, um, work number, evening number, cell phone, emails. We don't use these numbers or the email only for emergency. <coughs> you know, our generator went down, we have no electricity, somebody, you know, knocked the power out. And you had an appointment. We'll go and try to call you because we have it in the file. I say, sir, ma'am, don't show up. We're going to cancel. We'll send you another appointment. But, at, excuse me, if it's not for that purpose, we will never call you. Everything will be through mail. You'll get a certified letter through the mail. So if people say, well, somebody call you for what? To pay so much or because uh, we need more documentation for your application. No, that's not true. We will never ask for anything by, by phone. So how would somebody get information to be able to scan something before you say they're calling them and saying they're We never know. That's the mystery of, you know, technology, you know. Did they go through, did they hack our system? Did they actually, somebody, you went through an application and John Doe here is doing our application. He's writing down people's social security and number and he's aware, or they went through a process. We never know where the corruption will be. So we try to tell people, this is our process. 
We will only call you or send you an email to not come to a, an interview if it's an emergency and we can't really do the interview. Otherwise, everything's gonna be through the mail. We won't ask for money. We do not do any applications electronically, none. I know there's a couple things out there. We do not accept anything electronically right now. We do not process any application electronic. Everything has to be mailed. And the email? Email, obviously if we don't have, if we can't get a hold of you because sometimes you won't, you're in a job where you can't answer your phone, we might say, we'll send you an email as well, say, and you'll see the response, you'll see Juan M at USCISDHS.gov. So you know that's a good and said, please do not show up today to your interview or tomorrow because of these reasons, we'll send you a letter at rescheduling you. So we can't get you by phone, we'll send an email, but it probably happens no more than three times a year that we do that for that day only. Information about your residence, it says five years. Number one, obviously if you're doing a, a three year application, you know, you qualify for three years, it, it, you just turn it, you know, three years residency. And there's like four, four spaces that you can continue applying. where they ask for the date, I assume you would put down the date of the application that you're working on. That's correct. It's usually at the end. It's usually when you're signing, that's when the date is going to show up. At the I, end. I saw that yeah, and, and, and what happened, we all went to the last page. Yeah. Information about your parents. There's a reason why it says that. Many people, their parents became citizen at a certain time. And if they were under the age of 18, they derive citizenship from that parent. And a lot of people don't even know that. So that's why it's so important when you answer that, I said, is your mom or dad a US citizen? I said, yes, my dad was. Were you under the age? Do you remember when? And they tried to get as much information. The reason is, say their parents were, they were underage and they qualified for the N600. That's, they're already a citizen. They just never went through the process. They derive citizenship. They have to apply an N600 and pay $600. But if they pay for this one, and they are actually don't qualify for N400 because they're already citizens, they have to repay again. They have to pay again. <laughs> yeah. So it gets a little tricky. That's why it's very important when you see that one, it said, what's your parent? Were you under the age? And goes, well, I don't know. Okay, let's fill the application and just explain. If you were under the age, age of 18, disregard this, do an N600, and, you, and that's what you need. And they say, no, I was 18 already. Well, you're, you know, I have to be under the age of 18. If you're already 18 and above, then N400. They did not derive to the lease. We have that information. And it goes back again. Father's, mother's address, name. Parents could be divorced already, so that's why we Part six, um, it has a couple of them. The person is, stand, is sitting in front of you or standing in front of you doing this application, they might have been born male. At the time, they might be, they could be dressed as a woman. If they haven't legally got operated, they're still a man, male, even though they're dressed as a woman. But how do you? What's oh. good? They know, majority of these like LGBT members, community members, know. And they're very knowledgeable on what, because the state, it's a federal law. So obviously they know that process already. I said, you ask them, have you been operated? They'll tell you, no, I'm going through a process, okay. Bottom line, we don't know when or what, it's no. Right now, you're no, you still have the men, male part. So you'll put male even though they're dressed as a woman. Now, as I say, they were, they were operated, but female. Your job is not to criticize and argue, discuss, they should just put what they, 
And the majority of the LGBT members community know about this. Same thing with height. I talked, I told the group, uh, my mom keeps saying, I'm 5'2", she's like 4'9", and I said, you're not 5'2", but 5'2 is a magic number. You know, it's, don't argue, we'll do it, but I mean, some people will put a couple of inches more in here. Uh, just put what they say, we'll, we'll work with that. Just, uh, ethnicity, uh, number three, you got it. Obviously, number four, you said, well, select one or more. Any Latinos, Hispanics will fall under white. That's what, it's just what they use. You Why? know, that is actually correct. It, that uh, years ago, I, I don't remember where I read that uh, the Latino community, our peoples are considered Caucasian legally. Yeah. It, it, Unless they're the indigenous yeah. Aztec, which they don't exist anymore. Correct. So. Uh, number four will be white Latinos. That's pretty much the uh, biggest confusion out of, uh, from my time. <coughs> if you see somebody like myself, we're bald. <laughs> so you're the last one, all right? No There's no, oh, you gotta look up on here. No, no, you're bald. <laughs> if they shave their head and they have, you know, they can grow up long, and they're shaved, it's bald. <coughs> they say, well, I got brown hair. The day of the interview, <coughs> if they're bald, we'll change it, okay. Don't, you don't need to argue this guy. Okay. That's what you want. That's what we put. Is there an application? Is there money? If they, we'll, we'll take care of it on the day of their interview. So, yeah. So if they show up bald, we mark bald. Pardon me? If they show up bald, we mark bald. You mark bald. <laughs> For ladies, you might say, well, I might have brown hair, but before I take my pictures for my citizen, I might have red hair. <laughs> well, they need to know because the day of the interview, whatever you have, that's what we're gonna change it to. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Just back up just a second. Yes. I'm unclear about the N600. Yeah, the N600. Uh-huh. So if they come and they're doing this and they, I don't understand that. So okay, I can't, you come to me and, you, and I'm doing your application <coughs> and I say, is your dad or mom a US citizen? And you say, yes. I'm gonna ask you right away, when do they become a US citizen? Because I'm gonna get that date and your birthday and see what age you had. Now, if I don't have the time, or you know, I still do both of them, I say, how old were you when you began? I said, well, I don't know, maybe five years, 10 years ago. I mean, if you're 35 and 10 years, you're 25, you don't qualify. But if you're 25 and say, maybe 10 years, oh, 15, you qualify. And it's an easier process. It's a very easy process. That means, if say you were under 18, you derive citizenship. You're actually an American citizen already. You just didn't go through a process to get your certificate. So the N600 is just a process for you to get a certificate saying, I am an American. And it only has to be one parent? One parent. Oh, good. And it's $600. And $600. That's why it's N1660. <laughs> so that's, are we good? Yeah. 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 So that's what it is. You know, they're trying to separate. Okay, this is for people who are actually residents, but actually you're already a U.S. citizen. So you go through a different process for the application. I mean, pretty much everything is the same. They're asking, if you notice this application, it's all about that person, lifestyle, address, employment, parents. N600 is very similar. You know, it, this one has a little bit more of criminal uh, relationship and background. The N600 has a little less because you're an American citizen. We cannot remove that citizenship from you. You can be in jail, you can be a mass murder. We cannot deport you or remove that citizenship because you already derived that. You're actually a US citizen. Now, would the parents have gotten, when they became citizens, wouldn't they have put down their underage children? No, no. Because it's a, everything is individually. On their application, they must, and they probably did in their application, but they still have to apply for every single human being. Child. There's an application for every human being. <laughs> you don't, you, there's no application that, that takes a group, a family, and get the same benefit. You have a benefit, 
like deriving you a citizen, but you must have an application and a personal file for each person. Each person will have an A, by a number in a file. <laughs> Color, eyes, contacts don't, don't count here. So it's their natural colors of their eyes. And we take their word, like if this gal's got these gorgeous green eyes, and you ask her, we're in contacts, and she says, no, then you then put green. You, you put no, yeah, green. Yeah. When they come to us, we'll deal with it. Eagle. <laughs> no, no, we, we're more of a kind, gentle organization now. I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I can only speak of the five years I've been here, you know? <laughs> Common sense, if they're working, you put where they work. If they're going to school, where they go to school. And there's like, you notice, I don't know if you've seen the old application. Let's go back to the application. This, the new application just came out. It's been approved four or five months ago, but really it just came out like a month and a half ago. This, the one we're gonna, what you have is the newest one. The old version that started in <coughs> 2011 is good until May 2nd. May 2nd is the last time they, we're going to accept the old application. So this is the new application. From the old application to the newest, there's a, like 10 or 11 pages more. Oh. So it's a total of 22 pages. And we're going green. Imagine that. <laughs> Excuse me, Juan. Yes. I noted this is new also, right? Yes, the scanning, every page has a scanner. That means the process of your application, when you submit an application, it goes to our corporation called Lockbox, a group called Lockbox. We got one in Phoenix for the West Coast. So we're lucky we got one here in the West Coast. 99% of the employees there are contract employees. There's only like six or seven federal employees in that building. And what they do, they scan your application, they review it first, make sure all the um, your sign, everything's correct, the proper payment is there, the proper documentation is there, they'll scan it and then the process starts. When they scan it and it's approved, then you'll get a notice within two or three weeks saying, this is your appointment for your biometrics. And that's where the process, so it's everything, a lot of it is electronic for us. So this is just a way to scan it and make sure in, in case that form gets lost, they <coughs> scan it and they know what bio goes to. Um, as you notice, every application also on the top has the A number. You will put the A number on all of them. So if you know they don't have the name or address of anybody, it's just the A number, just the first page has. So they'll scan the bottom, and with the A number, they'll match the application, gets, it gets lost, or somehow it got separated. Employment, there's like four sections now of employment. Um, part A, time outside the United States. What we're looking for, especially for the Canadians, um, the Canadian border and the Mexican border for those towns, like myself, I grew up in San Diego. I used to cross the border a lot, on a, not a daily basis, but when I did, it was only day trips. We don't want to know about the day trips. We want to know if you went to Rocky Point and spent two days, three days, went on a cruise down. That's what we want to know anytime you left the United States. We're not, we don't want to know if you went to Alaska or Puerto Rico or Hawaii. No, we're talking outside of the United States territories. Okay, that's what we want to know. In order to qualify for this benefit, if you're doing a five-year uh, five residency, you, the easiest way is you must be in the United States half of the time. So half plus a day, for example. So you must have be more than half of the time in the United States. If you're doing three years, you must be half of the time, more than half of the time in the United States. So that's why we try to get them to tell you where they went, for how long. Estimate. We know a lot of people don't remember. I think I went for two weeks. But there are 16 days, December. From the beginning to the end, or you know, from the 15th to the 31st. Try to estimate what it is. What we're looking for is have you traveled? Because we'll know that you travel. And if you're being honest or deceased, that's really what we're looking at. And if you qualify, if you've been gone, um, 
you went to Mexico to take care of your mom for three years and you say you're a resident, but really you don't live here. You know, or you went because you got you just wanted the benefit you could qualify for for resident because your son or daughter lives here, but you're going back to Canada or India or one of these countries and you only come once in a month or every eight months you come for three months and then you go back, you don't qualify. And we'll find out because we'll have, we'll see there, we'll ask, you know, who do you live here? You know, a lot of these people are retired, mostly the ones who do it are retired, and they're coming back and forth to their own hometown because they have their house, they have all their benefits over there, and they just come here to visit the grandkids, spend the day. So they'll say, I live with my parents, I, or with my son or daughter, but they have no bills related to this. No visas with an address, no nothing. Phone number, no cell phone, no nothing related to that address. So we'll, we'll, that's ours, that's not you. I'm just giving you a little bit more information. Why this is important. What if they are honest about it and say, yeah, I've been gone for two years. You put it there. Yeah. Um, the best thing, is to say, after, here's the reason. One of the things that I'm, try, I'm trying to not to give you too much. If you've been out of the country for over a year, you don't qualify. Yeah, but then you would tell them that. I don't want to tell them that. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> now, we'll, we'll do it. But I mean, those are, thi those are little things, you know. At the same time, they're going to pay 680 just for me to tell them they don't qualify. That's why you, they better tell you that. Yeah, no, but I mean, <laughs> I, I understand I your situation, Yeah. but I prefer to them, if you're going to do the African economy, you know, just a heads up, you don't qualify, but if you want to process, you give your government $680. I understand. Because well, my whole goal of me telling you is that way we save these people from losing money, because a lot of these people don't have that money. Right. So when they give $680, and they don't qualify, then we do really justice for them. And you don't get it back, right? Oh, they don't get nothing. Government gives nothing back. So, so, so yes. any trip that they took within the last five years, that's one year or longer, automatic denial. It's automatic denial. What happens, they spend a year, year and a half. The day they came back, that's when their five years starts again. Oh, okay. So you say, you know what? You better apply next year. You, you make common sense calculations and say, okay, you were gone there. You were gone actually 14 months from today. Add 14 months to your, you know. So you start the five years from that time now. And that's not true if they're working for a U.S. corporation. That's correct. That's another one. Um, they can be gone out of the United States for almost all five months, five years, or three years, depending on. But they must have a contract saying, they, and they have a contract with the federal government working in another country. When we were in Iraq, there were a lot of people living in, in Iraq assisting with whatever it is, DOD missions. And well, is it just with the federal government or could it be with a private company? Private company normally will have a contract with the federal government. If it's just, you know, say Intel doing another thing in, in Vietnam, no, because that's private. You're not there for American purposes. So it is government. Yes. Just and you must have a contract. But it, it could be you work for Intel, and Intel has a contract with DOD. That's separate. That's different. So if, if, if you have a contract, your agency has a contract with the federal government, you'll get a copy and say, yeah, you know, Intel is working for DOD such and such and such country, and employees such and such is working there, and you know, Obviously, we match. Then they do qualify. All this is like they never left the country. You you might not see those many anymore because we've been out of the the war zone. But if you do, by all means, marriage status. Um, it's right now in front of me. You're married, divorced, <coughs> widowed. Not if you're going through a process. Not that you're getting married in a month or two weeks. It's right now. Are you married, single, divorced, or widow? It says separation only if you have legal documentation saying you're separated. If you, if that person with their spouse just verbally separated, 
and they haven't seen each other 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, they're, they're still married. married. If they cannot prove legal documentation, legal documentation either separate or, or divorce or marry, they're there. They're obviously widow, that's common sense. Uh, and that's it pretty now much. I don't think, I mean, I just can't imagine today in Prescott anybody, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. This is the question. <laughs> Two guys that are married, they mm -hmm. went to Washington and got married. Mm -hmm and came down and they both are applying and they're married. I mean, even though Arizona does not recognize that marriage certificate, we don't get into that. No. You do. We do. <laughs> they still have to qualify as a couple. Have they been over three years? Yeah, five, I was five just, years. I understand. Um, the, the question, don't get into it. Just say if they want to apply, apply. You know, are you married? Legally married? Yes, in Hawaii. Yes, in California. And I forgot what other Washington. state in Washington. They're married. That states recognize it, we'll recognize it. Really? They just have to be legally <laughs> three months in the same state jurisdiction, okay. married the three or five years. They still have to qualify everything else. A, a state does That's it. right. That was my question. Yeah. The so, Arizona yeah. state does not recognize that. So where does it come in? It doesn't because you're not doing nothing with the state. You're doing with right. the federal government. And so the they federal, federal government in their does accept it. Yes. Federally, it's accepted. State is not, but you're not doing anything with the state. You just live in the state. When did it get accepted by the federal government? I mean, I didn't know that. A year, probably? Really? Okay. <coughs> yeah. It really passed right 